welcome everybody to hashtag 52 boundaries and this week I am so delighted to have with me my friend Christelle Pellicue who is a coach and visual storyteller and we are going to talk about culture because that's a topic that's really really close to our hearts and the boundaries that we are all taking for granted that we never really think about both of us have often been they have been in our face because we've just shifted around on the planet so many times. But we also want to talk about culture in general, because not everybody moves around on the world in the world, but a lot of people have families that have a family mm. culture or a, a work culture. And so we thought we'd talk about, first of all, what is culture? So we have a framework that we can operate from. <laughs> so how do you define culture, Christelle? Um, so for me, culture is um, how our habits, our behavior, how we all belong uh, to the the same, I would say the same tribe, but <laughs> the yeah. same group of people. Um, that's how we connect, how we belong with them. So like I say, habits, behavior, um, the way we eat, we eat our cuisine, our food, uh, the way we dress maybe also some yeah. certain culture have a different uh, distinct way of uh, dressing so it's anything specific that identify yourself or that group together I would say yeah so for me culture is also it's uh, the very basic definition is this is the way things are done around here mm. you know like everybody knows the rules as you said everybody has the same habits and mm. and everybody knows how they're being done and so you can resolve conflict quite quickly because we all agree that this is the way it's done, right? So there's something called the, the cultural iceberg. And an iceberg has 10% above the surface and then 90% mm -hmm. below. And as you said, you know, like, how do we deal with time? How do we deal with space? You know, mm -hmm. how do we solve problems? How do we deal with gender? Those are all the things that underneath are underneath the surface. But clothes and, you know, like how we set up offices, how we set up houses, how we have parties, you know, like mm. time to arrive for a party, you know, like all of these things that 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 then contribute to how we interact with each other. That's a combination yeah. of all of those things. And yeah. so we take those totally for granted. Mm, yes, because uh, like you said, as the iceberg, we don't really see all 90% of what's going on underneath. So it's all those unspoken rules that, you know, people in that same culture would know between each other, but people yeah. from outside that culture would not automatically know. Yeah. yeah. So there's a there's an expression called cultural intelligence. And I I am I'm really passionate about cultural intelligence because I I I love going into other places and finding out how people do things there. Mm. Um, but I'm also very aware of the fact that it's very easy to say, no, I'm not going to do that. Or, oh, my God, if I don't do that, that's going to be really terrible. So, again, this is all the boundaries. So cultural intelligence mm. is, you know, to be able to detect when can I actually say, you know what? Yeah, I'll fit in with that. Or, you know what? No, I probably won't. I'll give you an example. I mean, culturally, people in Peru eat guinea pigs. Mm. I do not eat guinea pigs. <laughs> I don't eat dogs in China either. You know, mm -hmm. like there are certain yeah. things for me that, that I just won't do, that I yeah. where I will draw a line. But there are other things where I will go, of course, I'll fit in. That's not a mm -hmm. problem. So I thought it would mm -hmm. be really great to figure out, you know, the what does it take to actually maintain your ability to be in your culture, but also be flexible to deal mm. with others. And looking at, again, the difference between the soft, the rigid, the spongy, and the flexible boundaries, and, and just play around with those a little bit. Sure. Yeah, and I, and I think also it's it's to do, I mean, I see people who, who travel sometimes, well, like you say, very rigid, and don't actually want to try anything from that culture of the visiting and it's it's like yeah it's about finding balance really about trying a little bit but not forcing to go beyond your own boundary of what you're willing to 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 tolerate I suppose uh so yeah it's that balance it's not always easy to <laughs> to find it but I think if you go to a different culture you, you have to try to 
to be flexible and adapt a little bit uh, to what is going on in that culture. Absolutely. I think it depends on whether they are coming to you or you're coming to them. Yeah. So if I go into another culture, then it's really important for me that I look at what are the patterns, how to deal people mm -hmm. with things. And sometimes I, if somebody comes to me, then I can say, you know, these are the way, this is the way we do things. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. yes, again, I mean, time is one of my favorites, you know, like <laughs> how people deal with time. I mean, like in some cultures, you know, like, I, I mean, German culture, you know, like people come two minutes late and people have a hissy fit. Right. Mm. And other yeah, cultures, well, the, like, in, in the African culture, people turn up to our planes and it's okay. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So there's this whole being able to adapt. And, and again, it's also being able to, to do things in such a way that, that it honors other people's boundaries and, and maybe makes, accepts that that's the way it is. I, I'll give you an example. I, when I, I have South American friends and when I have a, I had a party and I went, okay. And I always know when I, when I went to the party, when the party starts at eight o'clock, I have to tell them that it starts at six because mm. they will generally show up two <laughs> hours later. Right. On that particular day, I had forgotten. I told them eight o'clock and we had a bring a plate party. So everybody contributed and they said they were going to make empanadas as an, as an appetizer. Well, they showed up. At a quarter past 10, when we were already having dessert <laughs> and made empanadas, which we then proceeded to eat at 11 o'clock at night. So again, it's the ability to say, you know, it's like I respect that people have their boundaries around time mm -hmm. and the way they deal with time. But I'm, I might be able to adjust that in such a way that it's culturally respectful. Have you had any experiences like that? Oh, yes. I mean, I I am African, and but I still have to... I struggle with time with my friend, my African friend, because, you know, yeah, I've got a friend who turned up late and is on wedding. <laughs> so, <laughs> and for me, that is like, no, 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 you can't do that. <laughs> um, so it's, it requires a lot of patience for me uh, when it comes to some of my friends with their timing. And, and I know it, and I know it, this is the way they are, and I should be used to it, but I still get frustrated um, about time. And also for me, I think time is, um, it's about respecting. Time is such a, for me, so precious. So uh, me waiting on someone else is, I'm not very patient with that because I feel like I've lost a big chunk of time that I could have used for something else <laughs> yeah. rather than waiting on someone. So I think you for me, to, it's part of a mutual respect that to respect each other's time. Absolutely. But you have other cultural influences, right? I mean, yes, you're, you're from Africa, but you also spent lots of time in France and now in the UK. Right. Yes, and I'm actually now in Portugal. So um, Portugal, yeah, yes. yeah I've moved. To, <laughs> I uh, I spent ten years in Madagascar, uh, eight years in France, twenty five years in the UK, and I've just been there a few months in Portugal. So I have yeah, I've moved around to a few different cultures, and I mean it's all European country, and you'd think oh it's Europe, it's pretty much the same, but actually no i mean the culture shock i had between france and the uk was quite intense <laughs> um yeah everything is you know food is different you know the way people um behave i think like in france you know you meet people very easily people are quite warm in the uk it's i find people a lot colder you know they're quite cold at the beginning, but once you get to know them, you know, you'll be friends with, with them for a very long time. Um, so it's a, a different way of approaching uh, people in those two different countries. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's different again. Mm. And, um, and I think it's, you know, it's Northern country. The UK is Northern country. It's tend to be the cold weather. You have a certain type of people who <laughs> behave. You know, I grew up in South of France where the sun is, all the time people are, you know, waking up with the sun, you've got a different attitude <laughs> as well. Um, so, yeah, quite a lot is playing um, in that. Yeah. Um, so, again, I'm, I'm just trying to find out. So when we when we talk about culture, it's something that we're born into, right? 
So we are born into a certain cultural context and then we literally absorb it through the pores, right? Mm. What, so my, my special f- field of interest has always been cross-cultural history, specifically mm. when two cultures come together and often there's a clash. So when you've got immigration history, so when the, the Germans move to the US, when the Italians move to, to Australia, you know, when the Chinese move to Germany, uh, to move to Germany, move to the, U- the US, and when they are so vastly different, there's a lot mm. of clash and people can really, really find it difficult to get along. Um, and it's really difficult when one culture considers themselves to be more superior than the other. And mm. um, so it's that, and, and this is the thing, I think this is one of the things where people just have really strict boundaries, right? Yes, when I go into another country, I adapt, but I also may keep some of my own customs. I don't want to turn myself into, you know, in, in, in Chinese American culture, they call them bananas, right? Mm. Yellow on the outside, white on the inside. Or in, in, again, because the white culture is so predominant. And then in black culture, you have the Oreos, you know, white, black on the outside, yellow on the inside. So there are all these derogative terms for somebody who doesn't own their culture. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it used to be that you had to fit in, you know, you had to be, in that place of just, you know, the white culture was predominant and you you had to get into that. And, mm. I, and I've always found that really difficult because I don't consider one culture more superior than the other. Mm-hmm. But it's the, it's the ability to adapt in such a way that you find a middle ground. And do you think that we've made advances in that area? Oh... Hmm. I think I think I think we still got a long way to go, um, and I think that's part of the reason why there's so many conflict all over the world at the moment. You know, it's um, there is always something. You know, look at Russia and Ukraine, and um, uh, I mean, even in the UK, you've got a big clash between white communities and black communities because you know they all have different culture and different way of seeing life. Um, so I think there's still quite a long way to go. And I mean, on my personal level, I when you are talking about how we assimilate everything, I I was adopted from Madagascar to France. And for a very long time, I think I just completely taken all the French culture and forgotten very much my own Malagasy culture mm. until... I think after I had my own daughter and realized, oh my goodness, I who am I suddenly? <laughs> mm. um, so I had to, you know, to almost unlearn some of the French way, my French ways to be able to absorb some of my Malagasy uh, culture. And even that, it's then I realized I've, I'm, I've become so French that I can't actually taken some of the Malagasy way of life because I, yeah, it's, it's very extreme compared to the Western world. So it's interesting how sometimes you get absorbed. You don't even realize that you actually absorb one culture, one dominant culture, because that is where you are. It's the environment. Although yeah. you are born in a certain culture, if you have moved out of that culture and really embedded in it without and as a, your original culture being around you, it's it's very easy to be embedded in that new culture and almost forgotten your old culture, actually. Unless you make, you have that conscious awareness that like, actually, this is who I am. Yeah. But when you are moved as a child, I think it's very difficult. If you move as an adult, then you can make that conscious decision that I'm going to keep some certain boundaries for my culture that I'm going to keep. But as a child, when your brain is still taking everything in, it's very, very difficult to yeah. to make that decision. I, I, from what I've learned studying cross-cultural history is that the first generation that moves to another country or, you know, spends a lot of time in another country, be it as an immigrant or an expat, they will they will keep their own customs. They mm-hmm. they will speak this, their own language at home. They will they have their rituals. They They stick with the culture that they were born in. The children of that generation, so the second generation, they generally want to absorb, be absorbed into the culture and become invisible. They want to fit yeah. in. 
Okay. And that's the bananas and the Oreos and, you know, all of those are not there. I'm sure there are other words, but it's the, I don't want to own anything of my own culture. Like, I don't want to have anything to do with it because it could potentially expose me to ridicule, to harassment, to all sorts mm -hmm. of things. So pe people, children want to fit in. Then when they've grown up and they've had their children, these children then go, huh, I come from a different <laughs> culture. Mm. How come we never speak this language? How come I don't know this language? And why mm. don't we have these rituals anymore? Why don't we have those? Why do grandpa and grandma have them, but we don't celebrate mm. them at home? And those are often the people who go back to the country where their grandparents had come from to find out what the background is and what the cultural background is and all of that. So again, I mean, I'm completely generalizing, but my sense is that we've become a little more, bit more flex flexible around these things because we now have access to food from all over the world. We have access from fashion, mm -hmm. um, jewelry, you know, like again, the way we dress, music, movies. Mm -hmm. There's We've yeah. become so much more, I'm not saying united, but more open to the influence of other cultures. But um, again, there's still the attitude of some cultures are more superior than others. Mm. Yeah, no, it is. It's, um, I mean, it, yeah, it's very, it's becoming very, more, well, it's diversified, I suppose, the way pe people are more, I don't know if it's the world is open. I don't know if we are more open or is it just because, like you say, the, we've got the internet and we've got technology now making everything so much easier to absorb. Yeah. Um, but it feels like it is the every country is becoming more and more mixed and you know different people uh there's a lot more movement I think yeah. also with traveling you know there is yeah. a ease with technology with you know plane and getting cheaper people are moving around a lot more than they used to be mm -hmm. so I think that's also contribute to the the melting pot of different um places of different city yeah. becoming very mixed. So people are sharing uh, the culture between each other and borrowing and <laughs> um, sometimes um, it's misappropriating, but yeah. <laughs> um, there's, yeah, there's a mixture. There's a, yeah. a willingness, I think, to, to for people to try different culture nowadays. Yeah. I generally make a difference. I don't know about you, but I differentiate between a tourist and a traveler. So mm. for the tourist is somebody who goes into another country and goes, what do you mean it's not the same here? <laughs> but these are my these are my standards. I mean, I know that I have traveled with people and they would go, you know, I've traveled with somebody in Peru and they'd say, this is not how we would do it in Germany. And I'm like, I would say, yeah, just as well, we're in Peru, right? <laughs> Yeah, and, I will. Uh, I would call those people. Though, it's the one who stay in the hotel. We don't leave the hotel. Stay in the, the swimming pool by the hotel and doesn't yep. even want to go uh, experience what's going on outside the hotel. Yeah, I, I've lived in ten different countries. So yeah. I and I, I remember one time I went to. Um, I lived in Taiwan and I had to go and get my visa reviewed. And I was like, okay, I've been in, I've been eating Chinese food for months. There was no Western food at the time other than lavash kiri and, and wonder bread, right? And craft singles. So I went over and I went, you know what? My friends and I said, let's go to the German pub and just have, you know, some German food. And I arrived and I met, ran into one of my classmates mm -hmm. who I hadn't seen in many years. And she was like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> I just told my friends about this crazy woman, you know, who was studying Chinese and, so anyway, so we sat down and I said, so how long have you been in Hong Kong? And she's like, oh, we arrived this, we arrived a couple of hours ago. Wow. And I said, and you're in a German pub. And she's like, <laughs> yeah, of course. I was like, okay, right. <laughs> so there's, and again, the observations that they were making was all about, this is not how we do it in Germany. This is how things being done. And again, there's the the attitude and that's the, the rigid boundaries and there's the, the flexible boundaries the difference between what's called ethno-relativity and ethnocentric. So ethno-relative mm. is somebody who can fit in and go, you know what, I'll see where my boundaries are. And the ethnocentric is, these are my boundaries and you have to fit into them even though I'm in your own, in your country. Mm. 
Yeah, I remember moving to the UK. I actually the first year I moved, I didn't want to be around any French people. <laughs> I didn't want I didn't want to leave France to be able to to be around French people again and uh, experience exactly the same thing as uh, as if I was in France. So for me, it was important that I get embedded into the the English uh, English culture, mm. and it's the same when I. I moved to or even travel to a different country. I, I try not to stay where I know the tourists are going to be. From, I mean, the British are everywhere. <laughs> so you tend to see British people everywhere when you travel. Uh, but I try to avoid to be uh, too much in those areas uh, so that I can experiment what the local people yeah. uh, are experimenting themselves. Yeah. So we can fit into a culture, but we don't have to take it all on. We can make choices around what's useful. We can appreciate that people have different outlooks. We can appreciate mm -hmm. that. And this is the thing as we make mistakes. I have made mistakes, cultural mistakes, where I would think that that's the way it was being done and it wasn't being done. But it's the ability mm. to say, oops, <laughs> let me yeah. start that again, instead mm -hmm. of going that's all wrong or dissolving into a puddle of guilt and shame and going, Oh my God, I should have known that. Now mm. we have talked about different countries, but let's talk for a minute about fitting into different cultures in at work, for example, in families. Mm. Like I know that I work as a consultant. I go into different company cultures all the time. And again, mm. people don't know that they have a culture until mm. somebody comes in who doesn't conform. Yeah. So have you had an experience of that? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've worked in different um, organizations throughout my life. And I mean, most of the time I've been lucky that, you know, it's been quite easy to adapt. But I have been in some organization where the culture was very rigid and, you know, it's it, it's just one way. And um, if you don't conform to their ways, then it's either you suffer or we are out. Yeah. And that's quite difficult to um, to to accept in a way because I think it's for me at the time it's more about how you're treating the people and how what is your culture of um, you know I'm quite flexible because there's so much I can take for myself this boundary of how I I will accept to be treated and if your culture is going to treat me in a certain way why are you gonna you know, reduce me to nothing, then I, I, I don't have to accept that that culture. So yeah, I have been in situation where it was quite difficult to conform uh, because it's it's almost like you're losing yourself. If you are willing to, to lose yourself, then you can stay. But if you want to keep, be uh, authentic and stay true to yourself, then you have to admit this is not the culture for me and walk away. And unfortunately, sometimes you have to do that yeah. if it's yeah if it doesn't fit. Yeah. So again, examples would be I mean things have changed since the pandemic and since we've started working mm. more from. But I, before the pandemic, I worked in organizations where it was like you had to stay at your desk until six o'clock. Mm. You know, and if you yeah. left earlier, people were saying, "Oh, you're not taking your job seriously enough." Obviously, um, <sighs> and a lot of people stay in cultures that are, and I, I use the word deliberately, toxic cultures. So mm -hmm. where people, again, there's the way in which they're treated is disrespectful. Um, mm -hmm. They, again, there's no autonomy. There's no focus mm -hmm. on competence. So might, there might be micromanagement. You know, you have to, like I, I worked in an organization where I had to, when I worked in Asia, where I had to show my boss all my, my faxes at the time that I was sending out. And he had to proofread them, whether they were in English or in German, and he couldn't read either. So, <laughs> but he insisted on doing that, and he was very strict on on all sorts of rules. And the the thing that I realized is I can either live with that, and then just say that's part of the culture, or I can get really, really resentful. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and I and I and often people do that. They get really resentful at work. They fit into a culture that they don't really want to fit into because. They think they need the job or whatever reason, but then mm -hmm. they take the resentment home and they take it out on their family. And that's yeah. the spongy boundaries, right? This whole yeah. anxiety of I'm going to make a mistake. I have to fit in, but I'm getting really resentful. Mm. 
Yeah, and it's not healthy. <laughs> it's not healthy at all. Um, yeah. And I think, we, I mean, like you said, with the, the pandemic and now people are working so much more flexibly, it's going to, culture have to be a lot more flexible the way um, they're doing things in their companies. I mean, the working week is one one for sure that people need to, to, to adapt because, you know, people have worked from home for two years and they did the job. And now we're telling them, no, oh, no, you cannot work from home anymore. Why suddenly your culture changed in the pandemic? You can't, you, you allow them to work. You're still expecting them to do the work, but then suddenly you're not allowing them to, to work, to continue to work from home. Yeah. And yeah. And I think also with, um, you know, there is you know, gender equity, you know, there is company need to, to be more flexible about how they're treating women yeah. in the workplace because a lot of um, organizational culture are not very good to women, you know, like when they're ter- taking maternity time, mm-hmm. you know, some company doesn't even agree for you to take that much time off. Um, so, yeah, there's some culture that need to be a lot more flexible as we move on. For sure. I think the as from my experience is um from talking to people is that what used to be underneath the cultural iceberg, you know, all of the way in which we deal with time and space and gender and problem solving mm-hmm. and all of the, you know, ethics and rules and all of that, a lot of the pandemic has brought a lot of those to the surface. So they're mm-hmm. now at the top of the, you know, above the surface of the cultural iceberg. And we're looking at is this really working for us? Do we have yeah. to be so strict around the way we, in which we enforce the cultural rules or mm, is there yeah. some flexibility? And I think yeah, and that's I think, really important. Yeah. And I think time is one of those um, mm. metrics that is very difficult actually, because someone could be doing a very good work in, within three hours. And as a person who probably take eight hours to do that same exactly. work. Yeah. Um, so it's very difficult to to judge um, just things by time. And actually, there's quite a few organizations nowadays who are moving to the four days a uh, week, who are um, piloting on that at the moment. And I think that is, for me, that's really exciting because I don't know why we have to work five days a week. <laughs> <laughs> I know. what is that for who, who set up this culture so I'm, I'm very much up for the four days week um and that's a working pattern and i, I hope that um, it does more, more organization take it on yeah and it, it's the whole i don't like the work that the expression work life balanced because it's never balanced but we've no. got <laughs> of a work life integration these days mm. so I mean, this is the one thing that I know my clients struggled with because, I mean, when you go to work, they've actually done calculations that the, the, the people actually work about three and a half hours to four hours on the job they're getting paid for. The other four hours, they're doing all sorts of other stuff, mm-hmm. talking to yeah. people, checking emails and all of that, checking social media, whatever it might be. Whereas when we sit at home and we sit in front of a computer, there is this need to confirm that we are actually of use because I've talked to a lot of bosses who said, how can I control that they're actually doing their work? You know, how can I trust them? And and people were really scared that if they weren't at their computer all the time and available at all hours, that they would be made redundant or that they, you know, there would be recriminations, whatever it might be. But I have to say to them, you know, there's nothing wrong with going and making yourself a coffee or putting a load on of washing on. Mm. There's, you know, just as there's nothing wrong with, you think there's nothing wrong with answering an email at 10 o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. So the boundaries that that are around work life at home, you know, have shifted. And that's a cultural shift we are still embracing. I'm not sure that we haven't quite gotten that yet. No. I was actually reading an article earlier um, about that employees are um, now, there's more and more people working from 7.30 in the morning until 1.30 in the afternoon then they're taking a few hours in the afternoon to do their personal activity yeah. and then come back around six o'clock and resume work again. Yeah. And I, I find that fascinating. I think it's it's such a better way of, it's very, a lot more productive, I think, for people mm. to be able to integrate some personal life into 
the work they as long as they can't um show that they've done the work and they're still doing the same as they did before i for me i don't see the problem they're still doing the work yeah. um no matter what time it is and some people are more productive at certain hours not everybody can work at the same hours no. when you know nine to five is not productive for everybody no so i think adapting to uh, individual cases is um, it's a better culture for me Absolutely. And again, a lot of people work across different time zones these days. Mm. So it's about working around that and but having boundaries in place for that. That's a, that, that's a totally different conversation I'm having with yeah. somebody. <laughs> but culturally, yeah. it's good to establish in a company, what kind of guidelines do we have around working? You know, what are our working hours? When we are, is it, are we contactable or not? So mm. Again, culture is such a massive topic and we could talk about this for hours, right? Absolutely. But I hope that this have has given people lots of food for thought to see, you know, where do you accept that culture is just the way it is and you just go with it, even if you feel awful about it or you have mm -hmm. resistance to it or you have really rigid boundaries or you bump against somebody's rigid boundaries or where are you more flexible and where can you negotiate and you know, create the culture that you really, you really want. Uh, because again, people make culture, culture doesn't, yeah. culture makes people, but people make culture as well. And when we change culture changes. Yeah. Any final mm -hmm. words of wisdom? Oh, final words of wisdom. I, I think I, you know, I would say to people embrace your culture, but like you say, be flexible to also, um experience other people's culture mm, yeah observe would be my thing yeah. observe without yeah. judgment yeah. just yeah. notice absolutely yeah yeah thank you so much christelle this has well, been thank you for having me it's been a pleasure yeah, <laughs> thank it's you. always great to talk to you <laughs> and you well here's to more exploring to exp learning more about culture and yes i know we're going to see each other again and i look forward to seeing everybody who is watching and listening i'll see you next time and please remember to subscribe so that you can get these conversations on a very regular basis thank you everyone <laughs>